While not one of Nintendo's best-selling franchises, Metroid has always been one of the most beloved ones in their library. It has a cult following and many acclaimed titles under its belt. I got into the series last year with the release of Metroid Dread, like a lot of people apparently, and ever since I got to experience that wonderful game, I've been itching to play more Metroid. I figured I could start by playing Metroid Prime, the series' first jump into 3D, and according to the reviews, it was quite a successful jump. You know, which is just in the top 20 highest rated games on Metacritic, nothing special. However, it wasn't without any issues because it was infamously released eight years after Super Metroid. Because I guess that game was too super and they couldn't figure out how to bring the series into 3D while also topping Super Metroid. So Samus kinda just skipped the N64 generation. What are you talking about? But with the help of Retro Studios founded in 1999, Nintendo R&D 1 could bring their vision of a 3D Metroid game to reality via their first person shooter engine with the game hitting store shelves in 2002. Despite looking like more of an FPS, the the team wanted to keep the spirit and themes of the Metroid series and not drift away from the Metroidvania genre. Was it good? Yes, but was it actually? We're here to find out today as I play Metroid Prime for the first time to see if it really lives up to the status of a masterpiece. Also, here's some analytics, so you kinda gotta like subscribe now. The story of Metroid Prime takes place between the original Metroid and Metroid 2 Return of Samus, because a perfect world where the Metroid chronology knows how to count just can't exist. Anyways, it begins with Samus Air and receiving a distress signal from a space pirate frigate. Upon arrival, she discovers that the space pirates on board were all murdered by their own parasite test subjects. Samus Samus battles with the Parasite Queen, but it falls into the ship's reactor core, which begins its destruction. During her escape, her suit also gets damaged, which causes her to lose some powerful upgrades in typical Metroid fashion, although at least you get to play around with a few of them in this prologue, like the grapple beam. She also runs into a cybernetic Ridley flying towards a planet in the distance during the frigate's destruction, so once she gets on her battleship, she makes it her mission to track down the new Meta Ridley in Talon 4. Throughout exploring this new planet, you can uncover more of its history by discovering certain areas or using the scan visor to read logs about the Chozo lore and stuff. Talon 4 was originally inhabited by the Chozo race until a meteor made up of Phazon designed by the space pirates impacted their planet and killed all of them. Phazon is basically this highly radioactive substance. By discovering places like the research labs in Fendrana, you can learn about how the pirates were studying Metroids. Eventually, with new abilities, you can explore the frigate crash site in the Talon overworld, which will lead you to the Phazon mines containing Phazon enhanced pirates, and by traveling deeper in the mines, you can discover their limited release phase on enhanced Metroids, which were extremely mutated. I really liked Metroid Prime's approach to storytelling because most of it is actually all optional. The majority of the lore comes from scan logs, so it isn't all shoved down your throat, and it also has an interesting world to uncover, which is fitting for a game about exploration. If you want to get a move on though, you can just do that. I wasn't super crazy with learning every detail of the lore and scan logs, although I will admit it was intriguing to venture deeper into the planet to uncover the devious shit those space pirates were brewing. Also, I gotta say, the soundtrack that accompanies Talon 4 is some pretty nice stuff. Some of you guys let me know that Metroid games usually have really good music, since I thought Dread's OST was forgettable, and yeah, I enjoyed this soundtrack, it's cool. Lots of groovy, yet atmospheric tracks to really immerse you in the world. I like this approach of having proper compositions more than Dread, which mainly had ambience and stuff. A few tracks are even remixes of ones from Super Metroid, and they're good. My favorite track may just be the title theme that also plays during the credits, it's simply awesome. Despite the game looking very different from previous entries at a first glance, Metroid Prime still manages to execute the series' traditional Metroidvania gameplay very well despite the tweaks it had to make. The gameplay loop still consists of exploring the non-linear world, encountering many foes, puzzles, and of course upgrades, to make traversal more interesting by letting you reach new areas to progress through the game. The core gameplay loop is still pretty fun, since you're thrown into this huge world after losing all your upgrades again, so you gotta explore with your pull of abilities that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. The world's design is obviously very non-linear. There's always multiple places you can explore and you're always rewarded with items like energy tanks or an important upgrade that'll help with progression. Every now and then, the game will throw you a bone and hint at a room you'll need to get to for progression, but how to get there and what abilities you'll need is never outright stated. Although I wish the game would stop telling me to go here before I had the fucking spider ball, it constantly felt the need to remind me, even during boss fights, like I fucking get it, bro. I like this approach. Exploration is still the main focus, 
this, but it just gives you a general idea of where to head next to keep the pace of the game in check. If you don't like this, then you can turn it off in the settings, or cry about it to prove your dumbass point about how this game sucks or something. The biggest fundamental change with the 3D transition is the first person perspective, and I'd say it works overall. It makes it a bit more immersive too, which is what Metroidvanias usually strive for. It enhances the atmosphere and mood of the world. The atmospheric details of isolation and mystery are still present. The world has many things to encounter, and you'll never know what you'll find next. It makes it pretty engaging to play. And also, a new lock-on feature has been implemented to help you stay focused on your enemies, which is once again about timing your shots well, with a bigger emphasis on strafing and dodging around your foes. There's a lot of variety in their properties, attacks, and weaknesses, especially towards the latter half of the game. You'll have to switch up your strategy very often when it comes to taking down your foes. Some enemies can be quite aggressive, and will feel very punishing if you think you can slip by them if you have to retread some areas. Unlike some 3D games, you'll rarely be able to safely just skip past enemies. Uh, except for these ghost chozos, they get pretty repetitive, and if you don't have the x-ray visor, they can actually be rather annoying to deal with. Samus can also nab lots of different weapons, and they're all really cool. The wave beam has great homing properties and can shock enemies. The ice beam really comes in handy if you want to quickly deal with enemies by freezing them. And the plasma beam absolutely kicks ass with a good rate of fire, and it does a lot of damage. These weapons even have optional add-ons you can find by exploring and are activated by doing a charge beam plus missile combo. They're alright. The super missile is cool, but I didn't use the rest that often since they'll seriously drain your missile ammo. Metroid Prime contains lots of other upgrades to collect that can bring you new abilities, but not all of the staples made it to 3D. There's no wall jump, no speed booster, and crazy shine sparks, and there's no space jump to break the level design. You know how OP Tails was in Sonic Adventure? That's exactly why this power up had to be omitted. The double jump is more than enough though. It feels very natural for this game and helps with occasional platforming since the perspective doesn't make for a good platformer. You do get some cool upgrades and power ups though, to not only make you feel stronger but also allow for more environmental puzzles and areas to explore. You don't get a lot of upgrades that genuinely add new moves though. Most of that is at the beginning of the game when you unlock the morph ball, missiles, and double jump. Most of the new moves are implemented into the morph ball, and I think they use the morph ball in much more creative ways than 2D entries which would usually just feature small passageways to roll through. They also stuck with the third person view for the morph ball because in first person I would probably throw up. How does Samus not get nauseated from this though? Does her visor also zoom out in the third person? Anyways, you can pick up the boost ball where you can charge it up for a speed boost and get to play with half pipes. Stay in your seats, Tony Hawk fan. And the spider ball also has some interesting uses since you can stick to walls and stuff. Lastly, you'll collect power bombs which are super powerful and can obliterate certain walls or objects made of bendesium. You can usually always scan objects of bendesium so you'll know how to destroy it. The level design also has much more clever use of the morph ball traversal, like these underwater tunnels where you can bomb jump super high and even get an energy tank if you explore. There's even this one room where you get thrown like a bowling ball. Nice car! Other upgrades include the grapple beam. It's of course fun to use because of the grappling hook. I mainly enjoyed how grapple points are placed in some areas to make backtracking easier late into the game when you unlock it. And despite the unconventional POV, it works well. Speaking of which, for some reason this game doesn't use both sticks like most first person shooters. I guess this was their idea of not becoming a generic FPS. Basically, the camera will move along with Samus when she turns and stuff, but this never really becomes an issue during combat since you'll usually be holding the L button to lock onto enemies, and the R button can let you enter a free aim mode at the cost of being unable to move. But I just find it weird how they implemented this to fix something that wasn't really necessary in the first place. I can't say it harms the game though, it's pretty inoffensive. A new type of upgrade you can pick up is the different visors, which take advantage of the first person view in nice ways. Not all of them are great, but I like how the new point of view brought its own bits of gameplay puzzle solving. The scan visor lets you scan objects and enemies to get a better understanding of the environment around you, and scanning enemies or bosses will inform you of their properties and possible weaknesses. Samus can also scan things to activate switches or buttons or whatever, which I don't really mind. I don't know what people think scanning slows the game down, since the majority of scans are completely optional. And in fact, if you're a big lore nerd, then you'll really get a kick out of scanning every speck of dust to learn more about the Chozos and whether or not they use their left or right hand while wiping. A thermal visor can highlight any thermal energy around you, and it also goes hand in hand with the wave beam, which can charge points of electricity. It's used quite cleverly in the Thardis boss fight, where you have to use the visor to locate his weak point while being careful to not go into sensory overload by getting hit. Although his attacks are very predictable, and this fight just goes on and on and on. 
Wait, what? Lastly, the X-ray visor can reveal secret invisible things like platforms, enemies, or even walls. I wasn't a huge fan of this one. It felt kind of dumb whenever I was in this one area trying to figure out how to get across the gap and then, oh, there's just invisible platforms here. Yeah, I really should have thought of that. I'm fucking retarded today. I think the thermal visor can also expose the Chozo enemies when they're invisible. So that's a bit of a weird overlap. And on top of that, the thermal visor makes it easier to see in dark places, which the game throws you in from time to time. I recommend turning your brightness all the way up in this game. Samus also obtains upgrades to her suit because, at the beginning of the game, that explosion magically made her regress like that. You'll obtain the various suit which comes with the ability to survive under extreme temperatures as well as big ass shoulders, and the gravity suit which makes underwater traversal much easier at the cost of having this weird purple. Towards the end of the adventure, Samus gets corrupted by pure Phazon by this space pirate that falls on her, so instead of trying to dodge, her suit just absorbs all the Phazon and gets the ability to survive contact with Phazon. Oh yeah, and this suit's design is super badass. Fucking love the Phazon suit. Yeah, there aren't a lot of power-ups that drastically change Samus' moveset because being in 3D as well as in first person comes with more restrictions for her mobility. Most of them come with combat advantages and allow you to explore in new ways, which is fine, because Metroid Prime mostly has an emphasis on exploring and combat. In fact, let's talk about how world design transitioned to 3D. Since 2D and 3D are fundamentally different, the level design is noticeably more horizontal rather than being a blend of both that and vertical. Vertical rooms do pop up here and there, but most of them end up being spiraling floating platforms, which can get a little repetitive during retreads. Most of the room design focuses on solving puzzles to get through, dealing with enemies that can get in your way, and platforming every now and then. It has been de-emphasized because of the FPS direction, but it works as a means of traversal since it rarely asks for precision decision in your jumps. Actually, I missed one jump, so scratch that. This game fucking blows. God damn it, I, I can't take this shit anymore. A few moments later. Oh fuck yeah, now we're talking. Metroid Prime does feature a lot of interesting puzzles to encounter, which make up for the rooms not having as much verticality or platforming. A lot of them come in the form of using your visors or more fall abilities, especially because, like I said earlier, it's used very creatively. The 2D tunnels are also fun to travel through because of how they use the more falls abilities. The level design is pretty fun to explore, however, I kind of felt like the pacing of the game was a little too slow in some areas. I guess this relates more to Samus herself because because in 2D she was much more agile, and that isn't really possible to the same extent in 3D. Like I said earlier, that's fine for what Metroid Prime is trying to do for the most part, but when it comes to Metroidvanias where backtracking is a staple due to the inherent design, it leads to times where you have to backtrack and sometimes it just takes forever. A notable example is how you have to acquire the double jump to travel further in Fendrana, so you have to pass all the way through the Magmore Caverns which takes fucking forever then get to Talon Overworld where you receive the upgrade. Then you gotta get back to Fenjana again, which means retracing your steps in Magmore Caverns all over again. I swear, you have no idea how many times I've had to truck through this place just to get to somewhere else. I felt like I was exploring this pretty linear path to get to an elevator more often than when I was actually exploring new areas in Magmore, since the elevators are placed very far apart. Backtracking is kind of just a fundamental aspect of Metroidvanias, but since Samus isn't as athletic in 3D, it's just slower, and sometimes it can get kind of boring, to be honest. And also, towards the end of your adventure, there is a certain scavenger hunt that really accentuates how slow backtracking can be. I'm of course talking about the search for all 12 Chozo artifacts, they're like a collectible. After obtaining the Phazon suit, the game suddenly asks you to find all 12 of these things because they control the seal of the impact crater, the source of all the Phazon in the final area of the game. And okay, you can stumble upon the artifact temple a little early into your adventure and even get one very easily there. It tells you that you'll need to find all 12 to gain access to the impact crater and scanning these stats statues can even hint at their locations. I'll be honest, I kind of forgot about this after encountering it because I assumed it was some optional thing, and that could be a skill issue, who knows, but that's not what I'm complaining about. If you're very curious and explore a lot, you could find a few naturally, but most of their locations require you to use some late game upgrades like the x-ray visor, power bombs, and the plasma beam. And sorry, when I got to the plasma beam, my immediate instinct wasn't to travel all the way back to the Fenjana research facility, jump into this one building, shoot these boxes, and melt the frozen window with my plasma 
beam, shoot a missile at this thing holding up the tower that I can't lock onto or scan or anything, then enter this hole once the tower falls, grab an artifact real quick. Most of them aren't that confusing or complex because I cherry picked that example for the sake of being funny, but regardless, it's still going to require some backtracking and in my case, it required a fucking lot. And it can really highlight how slow retreads can be in this game because it took a couple of hours for me to get all of them. And in a game where the structure sees you exploring deeper and deeper into the world, having to suddenly go back to like every location slows the pace down to a crawl. And overall, I just didn't like the artifact quest that much. It could have worked as maybe some optional thing where you get a super strong upgrade once you- Okay. It could have worked as maybe some optional thing where you get like a super strong upgrade once you collect all of them, or possibly the game could have only asked you to collect like half of them or something to reduce the tedium. From time to time, Samus will run into big bosses to challenge you and usually drop an important upgrade. How fun are these fights? They definitely vary in quality. Some are kind of fun, but others get stale pretty fast. In the prologue, you run into the Parasite Queen, which is fine. It's easy, but it teaches you the basics of combat and bosses. After that, the first real boss you encounter is... Lagra, which isn't too hard and it's okay. I think I pronounced that right. You have to knock over the solar panels to uncover the weakness that you have to bomb with the morph ball, but over time there's more panels to hit so you'll have to distract it with gunfire so it doesn't have the chance to push any of them over again. Most of the attacks also aren't too hard to dodge. Next up is Thardis and Fendrana. He's this boulder guy. He only has one specific weak point so you'll need to locate it with a thermal visor while not taking damage and going into overload which fucks up your visor. I like how it has a clever use for the thermal visor but he's easy to evade and it takes like 10 minutes for some reason. It just drags on. The Omega Pirate honestly feels pretty similar to the other phase on elite enemies where it absorbs beam weapons whenever it's not attacking you so you have to time your attacks with his attack. It doesn't help this one takes a while too so it got pretty repetitive. It spawns in other pirate enemies after you destroy all the armor which isn't bad since you have to frantically kill all of them by switching beam weapons then use the x-ray visor to shoot him while he's healing. Although being able to lock onto all the different body parts can make you end up locking onto other parts just because you're moving around, and it's kind of dumb how there's phase on in the corners which you take damage from, since the nature of bosses in this game will see you circling around the arena so it feels kind of unfair. A few of the mini bosses include this incinerator drone that's pretty simple, the adult she goth where you have to use missiles until you possibly run out then switch to the fucking morph ball bombs, and the cloaked drone in the phase on mines which you can't lock onto, so it really just highlights how awkward aiming can be with the lack of twin stick aiming. Once you collect all of the artifacts, you can finally unlock the impact crater and reach the finale, but suddenly, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's Meta Ridley flying through the sky with this slow-ass dive bomb attack. If there's one thing bosses should never have in video games, it's having the player essentially just have to wait for the weak point to be revealed, and this boss kinda does that. The attacks are really slow, since you just watch Ridley fly around, although the second phase is a little better. But after dealing with that nuisance and hearing that banger during the boss, Samus can finally reach the impact crater. But before the final boss, there's one last room and I'ma be honest, I know it's short, but this entire place fucking sucks. It introduces fission metroids, and sorry to get off topic, but I hate these guys. Metroids can already be a big threat, since in first person they'll cover your view entirely and you can only shake them off with a morph ball bomb. But now they duplicate and have specific elemental beam weaknesses, so you can only take out one at a time even though you're always ganged up on. And the level design certainly doesn't help either since it has a bunch of small platforms, so sometimes it feels like dodging is just straight up impossible without falling and taking damage from the red phase on on the floor. It also kinda sucks that the safe point was placed right before this room and not the boss room, so if you die you'll have to deal with them again. Oh no, oh no, oh no! Fuck, 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 no! Get away from me, no! Oh, I can, I can use power bombs? Huh? I know it's not that bad since it's just one room in this case, but I can't stand when shit like this happens in games since it just feels artificially difficult having to deal with this stuff again and not just the boss, especially if it's the final boss, and the final boss is Metroid Prime, a Metroid mutated by the extreme amounts of phase on from the meteor it came from. Wait, so this is Metroid Prime? Has this box art been a lie? It's not a bad final boss. You have to switch to the beam weapon that corresponds with its color and it has a lot of attacks, some of which can be kind of 
of hard to nail. It does go on for some time, but it's more engaging than the others that are long and boring. I will say though, towards the end, it starts switching color way too fucking often. Sometimes I won't even have time to charge a single charge shot, and that's just kind of annoying. Surprisingly, the second phase against Metroid Prime's core essence is shorter, simpler, and easier. Its attacks aren't hard to dodge at all and get predictable, and it also switches from visor to visor for some reason. It doesn't really add much to the boss fight. You get to deal damage once it starts oozing phase on, and that activates your phase on beam, which is super fucking powerful and feels very satisfying to use. I like stuff like that in Final Bosses. The boss fights of Metroid Prime are a mixed bag in the end. A lot of them are cool and climactic, but some of their predictable patterns don't warrant their length, and most of them just kind of needed to deal more damage, honestly. Pacing issues, basically. Kind of like the progression. Seems to be a running theme. Speaking of running after defeating Metroid Prime, its remains absorb all the phase on and Samus, so you're reverted back to the gravity suit as she hightails it back to the ship and makes her escape. You don't get to play through an intense escape sequence, though, but at least you did in the very beginning of the game. So that was Metroid Prime, and in typical Metroid fashion, it shows you how many items you collected in your completion time. Most Metroidvanias are replayable because of their design, since you get more familiar with the layout to complete it faster, and if you're skilled, you can do sequence breaks, like getting the double jump as soon as you land on Talon 4. I was gonna try and do that on this playthrough, actually, but I sucked ass, so I didn't want to spend too long on it. Apparently, this doesn't work on the player's choice version of the game, yet another reason why player's choice in Greatest Hits is one of humanity's biggest sins ever. This one killed my family. While I can see how this game is replayable, it took me 15 hours on this playthrough, which is much longer than the 2D games like Dread, where I spent 9 hours on my first playthrough and eventually lowered it to 6. Combined with the slow backtracking and Samus not being as agile, I don't see myself coming back to this one as much as I would with some 2D games because they're faster and shorter. Also, I don't get to see Samus' boobs, so I have no reason to live anymore. But I can see myself revisiting this game one day because... In conclusion, I thought Metroid Prime was actually really good. It fantastically brought Metroid into 3D with lots of cool ideas, as well as aspects that were great in their own right, like combat and exploration. Discovering more parts of the world as you get stronger and stronger while also encountering stronger and stronger foes feels great, man. I can see why so many people hold this game in such high regard, but for me personally, I wouldn't quite call it a masterpiece. Don't get me wrong, this game was amazing, but the backtracking gets a little boring sometimes, and the game does kind of have issues issues with pacing in both the boss fights and towards the end of the game with the artifacts. I also think Dread is more replayable, and to be honest, I don't really have any issues with that game, so I think I still prefer Dread, since Samus is much more fun to control. Yeah, I know it's not exactly a fair comparison, being 20 years apart, but since I'm a fairly new fan, I'll document my thoughts on what I've played so far. If you're into the genre or just first-person shooters, you should give this game a shot. It does lots of things really well, and it was damn fun to play overall. I can see this being a good pick as your first Metroid game, for it being the first game in a new sub-series. So yes, Metroid Prime is worth it because it's 3D, unlike stupid-ass Metroid Dread with 2D. Like, how is this indie game worth $60? So go play Metroid Prime.